Hello, everybody. Welcome back to this beautiful place. And now for our plenary today, we have Sarah Mercer. Thank you for being here, Sarah. She's a professor of foreign language teaching at the University of Graz, Austria. I'm not sure I'm saying that correctly. <laughs> Where she is head of ELT methodology. Her research interests include all aspects of the psychology surrounding the foreign language learning experience. She's the author, co-author, and co-editor of several books in this area. Currently, and in the past few years, she has been principal investigator on various funded research projects examining language teacher well-being. She works on the editorial board of various journals, was co-editor of the journal System for several years, and is currently vice president of the International Association for the Psychology of Language Learning, and also serves as a consultant on several international projects. In 2018, she was awarded the Robert Gardner Award for Excellence in Second Language Research by the International Association of Language and Social Psychology. So welcome to Salamanca, Sarah. And this is just a simple souvenir from the city. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here. All yours. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I have to admit, I'm slightly intimidated by this room. Um, it's beautiful uh, and a little bit on the scary side. OK, so I'm going to talk today with you about um, something that I've only just sort of got into in recent years, and it's kind of new to me. So if I'm a little bit bumpy along the way, I apologize. I'm still finding my own feet with this topic in this area. Um, OK, how many of you would like to change the world in some way? Hands up. Okay, that's pretty unanimous, I think. Well, I've got some very good news for you. That as a teacher, you do that every single day. Um, there's this great quote by Henry Adams, the teacher affects eternity, he, I apologize, can never tell where his, I apologize, influence stops. And for me, this is one of the power of being an educator is that you have an enormous influence on the world around you. You have an enormous potential to impact and to change society. Everybody does, but teachers particularly are in an incredible position. And I think that we can make a difference. And I think we have a responsibility to make a, dif a difference. OK. I'm going to get you all involved. We have got three problems that we need to address collectively, everybody in this room. And we can all make the difference, in my view. Um, I'm going to start off the first problem by giving you a little survey to do with your partner. In two words or less, what would you want for your children in life? And the second question, in two words or less, what do you think schools teach? This was a survey that um, Martin Seligman has done with a group of with parents across various countries, and we'll look at their answers in a minute. Let me give you a second to just talk to the person next to you about what you think your answers would be, and can we have a strategy when I say thank you, and I put my hand up, can you do the same so that we stop talking pretty quick? Otherwise, I might lose control of 300 people. So it, when you finish talking, just to try and speed things up a little bit, I'll just say thank you and put my hand up. And if you could stop talking and put your hand up, it should stop us a little bit quicker. OK, go ahead. OK, thank you. If you aren't teachers well behaved, thank you. OK, let me show you what they said, and let's see how this resonates with what you said. How does that match what you said? OK. 
So in other words, what parents wanted for their kids, essentially, was they wanted well-being. They wanted their kids to be happy. They wanted them to flourish in life. They wanted them to be rounded, happy, contented individuals. <sighs> what did they think schools taught? I don't know how that resonates with what you said. But they teach the tools of accomplishment. Now, it's not to say that we don't need those things and that they're not relevant. But there is a little bit of a question that comes up about whether we quite have the balance right. So it's not to say that those things are not important things to teach our kids, that they want to survive and they want to succeed in life. But some of those things at the beginning also need teaching as well. And there's a wonderful book by a guy called Guy Claxton called What's the Point of School? And I'll just let you read the quote. So there's a sort of deeper purpose of education that's not just about passing exams and completing subjects and doing the exams successfully. And I'm sure, and I know my own family, that there are people who are not academically successful, but they've got great skills and great talents that are not really being recognized in our school systems. And that's perhaps a whole other issue. A fabulous quote by Albert Einstein, that education is what remains after one has forgotten what one's learned in school, mildly depressing, and we're hoping that that's not the case. But there is a sort of recognition, and this was something that Gustavo talked about in his talk this morning that I attended, is that there is a recognition that school systems are not necessarily meeting all the needs that kids have in life today. And that the school systems that we work within are school systems that were established hundreds of years ago. Now, we as teachers have already adapted and changed. You're not using the methodologies that you were using 10, 20 years ago. And if you look back at how languages were taught in the 1960s, they probably wouldn't recognize the classrooms that we use today. So education has changed, but it tends to have changed on the level of teachers. We have made the change. We have changed what teaching and schooling looks like. But the system as a whole has been relatively resistant to change, um, broadly speaking. So there's a big sort of philosophical question, and I'm not sure I want to open this can of worms, but I'm going to anyway. Um, what is the purpose of school? Why do we send kids to school? Why do we expect kids to go to school? And these are some of the things that have come from various places. We want kids to flourish in life. We want them to realize their potential as individuals. We want them to become autonomous, creative thinkers, critical agents in society. We want them to get social emotional competences to manage their own emotions, to have positive relationships in the workplace and beyond. And we want to generate in them a lifelong love of learning so that they remain curious for the whole of their lives. This is what we don't want them to do. We don't want to mass produce learners who conform to some narrowly defined, standardized norms solely for employment in the workplace, she says rather cynically. So what we really want, and I don't think there's a single educator in the room who would disagree with me, is we want to empower kids to be the best version of themselves. And we want to empower them to function in life. And life is not just about your job. There's a lot more to living than just going to work and ticking those boxes. So one of the things that has had to change and has changed, and one of the problems that we have to address, is that education systems as a whole are perhaps no longer fit for purpose. They still resemble these factory models of education that were predominant in the 1800s. And we haven't made massive shifts from then. But teachers have. You, as agents of change, have transformed education, so it does look very different. But there is some other underlying systemic issues that still need to be addressed. And I'm going to come back to those a little bit later. OK, talking of critical thinking skills, let's have a look at number two. Just take a minute or two with your partner. What do you think that it is referring to? Go ahead.
Okay, I'm going to give you one more clue. That silenced you. Does that help you see what the it might be? Shall I spare your... This was some research that I've done with some colleagues recently with teachers in Norway. We researched with teachers in Norway and teachers in Austria, we researched their experiences of being an EL teacher in contemporary times. And this was a quote by Tina, and the it's referring to English as a school subject, somewhat scarily. I'll just go back and let you reread that and replace it with English. I have to admit, this freaked me out. <laughs> As an ELT teacher, and I've been teaching ELT for 26 years, um, this interview has given me a little bit of a jolt, and all of this data has given me a little bit of a slightly alarmed perspective. So what happened when we talked to the teachers in Norway is something perhaps very particular to Norway. And you all work in different contexts, so this might not be as relevant, but I think it might be a little vision of the future that we would be wise to pay attention to now. So I found that it was huge in our Norwegian data. It was a big theme for the Norwegian ELT teachers working in secondary school. It wasn't such an issue in Austria, except I got home from having been to a data collection meeting. We'd been analysing data in Bergen, and I came home. And just by chance, two of my teachers who work in school and work at the university said, Sarah, can we have a meeting with you? We've, we, we're facing a problem, or we're starting to face a problem, and we'd like to do something, and we need your advice. Sure. Completely independent of this, they said, we're starting to have problems with kids' motivation in school because they're saying to us, English is irrelevant. We don't need English. We've got enough English. We use English in our free time. We have enough English. We don't need English in school. So I can say it's starting in Austria, and I don't know about your settings where you are. So the question is, is our secondary school students starting to see LT as a subject on its own in school as irrelevant? Because this was what the, these three things came out in the Norwegian data. They believe that their English is good enough anyway, so they don't need any more. They have relatively low levels of learner engagement. It's very hard to engage the students in the pure English classes. I'm talking about really just ELT classes now. And the teacher's well-being is suffering because English as a subject is losing status, despite the fact everybody seems to think it's so important, but it's losing some degree of status in school. And it's also the low learner engagement, of course, is extremely demanding for teachers. And there are three possible reasons why this is particularly the case in Norway, and some of these may resonate for your own settings. Um, they start English in primary, so they're starting English fairly seriously already at six years of age. And I'm not talking about you know, a few songs, I'm talking about they're seriously starting to learn English at an early age now. They have widespread CLIL and EMI throughout the whole schooling system, so also particularly in secondary. And of course, there is massive access to and use of English beyond school. So through ELF and technology, but also through media, TV shows and so on, they have quite a lot of TV programs in the original with subtitles. So they have massive exposure to English. So you can see that for the Norwegian kids in school, ELT is becoming an irrelevant school subject. I'm not trying to depress you all. There's a sort of, sort of stunned, depressed sense. I promise I have a solution. So we're getting to a healthy part in a minute. But this is quite, this is new for me. I haven't really thought about this. I haven't reflected on this. And this is the first time that I've encountered it in data that I've been working with. But it has caused me to stop and think, what trajectory is our field on? Where are we headed? And should we be taking any remedial action? OK, where, you know, where are we going now? And there's a related problem that came out of the data in Norway, and it's one that's fairly familiar, is ELT teacher status and well-being. Um, it's fairly well known that teaching of all professions suffers from high levels of stress, burnout, and there are record levels of attrition. So that means teachers leaving the profession, not choosing to stay. Um, interestingly enough, one major factor in teacher stress is how the profession is perceived. So is teaching generally taken seriously and respected and appreciated and valued? 
a whole other issue. And then looking at ELT specifically, is ELT respected and seen as a serious profession, seen as something worthwhile? Now, we're at a TESOL Spain convention. We're at a professional association. You guys are committed to this career. I'm extremely committed to this career and this profession. But it's not about how we feel. It's how other stakeholders and outsiders view us from the outside. So we're here, we're committed, we're dedicated, we've come here this weekend because we are passionate about what we do in our field, but do others see it in the same way? And interestingly, there has been a study in Spain and the, relate, the status related variables were more indicative predictors of burnout than regular stresses in the classroom. So the lack of respect, the lack of appreciation, the lack of a sense of value had a stronger impact on teacher well-being than the regular stresses that you would experience on a day-to-day -day basis. And I'm going to talk a little bit about this because I know there are people from different backgrounds and I want us to understand that we're in this together. There's a fantastic paper by these two authors which looks at ELT as ecology. So ELT is a form of instruction, how we do it. It's a disciplinary field. It's a profession, and it is also a business and a service. So I'm sure that there are DOS here. I'm sure that there are people working at private language schools here. I'm sure that there are school owners here as well. And we're all in this together. And it doesn't matter where you are. What they were showing is that all of the different aspects of the field affect how we're perceived in our status. So for example, all arts and humanities are typically assigned lower status than STEM subjects generally, and that's a global finding. Um, the professionalism, professionalism of ELT varies, so not everybody takes it as seriously as we do in this room, and that also can contribute to lower status perceptions. Um, there are very precarious working conditions in the private sector, something I've complained about and we'll talk about at length on other occasions. And now, adding to that, we may have possible changing perceptions of English as a school subject. So, our status is something, I am incredibly proud to be an ELT teacher. I'm proud to be in a profession of people who are committed, are dedicated, and are here on a Saturday listening to me rant. So I think it's an awesome profession to be in. But are other people valuing and esteeming what we do in the way that I personally think that they should? So the third problem is that ELT teacher status and well-being is a little under threat, not just ELT. I should stress, but teacher well-being generally is known to be a problem. So the three problems that we, as individuals in this room, can all address, we can look, we can do something about the education systems, because we're in it, so we shape it. We can do things about ELT and the relevance and the perceived relevance of it, because we teach it, so we're in it. And we can do something about ELT teacher status, because we are ELT teachers, so there's something we can do about the status. So let's have a little look about how I propose that we could start meeting these challenges. There will be other things. I haven't got, if I had the golden cure for this, I'd be a millionaire living on some tropical island probably. But I have got a suggestion that I hope will help. I've just finished reading the wonderful book called Start With Why that some of you may know by Simon Sinek. And it really kind of just struck home to sort of meeting all of my problems at the moment in this talk. He says that very often in businesses and also in professions, we start with the what and the how. What do you do and how do you do it? And a lot of our professional development courses are about that. So a lot of our professional development in ELT looks at what do we do and how do we do it? And that's important. But he says it's more effective and more powerful when we start with the middle, the golden circle. We start with the why. Why do we do it? Why are we ELT educators? Why do we teach? Why are we involved in education? And so the, starting with the why says, why are you an English teacher? And then we'll get to how do you teach and what do you teach? So just take a moment with your partner and share something nice and positive. Why did you become an L ELT teacher? Or at the moment, what meaning or purpose do you take from your job as an ELT teacher? Go ahead.
Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, anybody want to shout out? Yeah, volunteer asking is always a bad idea. Anybody want to shout out their reason for being an ELT teacher? Yeah? Okay, help students have a better life, sure. What else? Me too. I became a teacher by turn. And six months after starting the career, I decided I didn't want to be a teacher. Me too. That's exactly what happened to me. I went into teaching by accident. I taught for a year, and then I said I can't do anything else ever again. So yeah, I fell into it by chance, but I became committed to it for a reason. Anything else? Anybody else? Yeah? <laughs> and are you now thankful to them? Yes, There you go, you see? Um, but you stayed in the profession, I assume. So it's not about, we, we all start with different motivations. And like Annie, I, I actually wanted to be a politician. I wanted to be a lobbyist. I wanted to go, I know. Well, you'll see, I'm going to get really ranty today. So I, I wanted to be a politician. I wanted to go into politics. And then I spent some time with politicians and thought, I don't think so. <laughs> Not for me. And then I made a change of tack and went in and had a year in education. And then that was the end of it. I was sold and hooked and could never go back. Um, there's a wonderful model of well-being called the PERMA model. For those of you who are not familiar, I'll just go briefly through it. The PERMA model is a eudaimonic model of well-being. That means that well-being is sometimes misunderstood as being primarily about hedonism, about having a good life, enjoying life, and so on. Yes, that's part of it. But a eudaimonic understanding of well-being says that it's about a long-term perspective. And that involves these kinds of things. And I've, got, I've highlighted some of them here. So you've got positive emotions. Finding flow, engagement, getting into what you're doing, getting into absorbed by what you do. I think that probably every teacher in the room has got into that at some stage. Having authentic connections, positive relationships. And this is one that's critical, is getting meaning from what we do. Drawing a sense of purpose, drawing a sense of meaning out of what we do. And in a recent study that we've done with my team in Graz, we found that teachers put up with, excuse me for saying this, a lot of crap because they draw a lot of meaning and purpose from what they do. So one of the reasons why teachers do what they do is because they get meaning and purpose out of it, because they see a sense in what they're doing and they can make a contribution through it. And the sense of achievement, the final part of, of uh, PERMA, is not about sort of material success, it's about gaining meaning from achieving things that are of value to you. So when we start with the why of why we are language teachers or why we are still language teachers now, a primary drive that will contribute to our well-being, that helps us to be successful and flourish in our jobs, is that we draw meaning and purpose from it. And we do that pretty much anyway. But we can expand that. We can strengthen that. This is a lovely story. President Kennedy went to visit Nasser at this period of time when this was very... And he visited and he went to speak to the janitor. And he asked the janitor what his role was. And he said, well, sir, it's to put a man on the moon. And this story has been used a lot to cite that when you connect what you do to a bigger purpose, it is healthy for us to see the big picture. And as language educators, my goodness, we are about creating communicators, helping interconnections, fostering intercultural communication, promoting a, an appreciation of diversity and tolerance. That's the foundations of ELT. Um, and when we look at that education, one of my all-time favorite people, education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. And you do this anyway. You don't have to be Nelson Mandela or Gandhi or Mother Teresa. You do it. You do it every single day when you go in to teach. And that's one of the things that is so valuable about our jobs and our profession is even the small acts you do on a day-to-day -day basis make a massive difference to your learners. So I'm not necessarily talking about massive changes in what you do, but an appreciation of the power that you have to make a difference to your learners, but also maybe also connecting to the bigger picture. And what I'm going to talk about next will help us connect even more to that bigger picture, perhaps.
So that's starting with the why, finding the meaning and purpose in what we do as ELT educators. That's the best buffer we have against any threats to our well-being. So let's have a little look at the what and the how. I'm going to suggest that something that we've been working on with some colleagues, inspired by positive psychology, is something called positive language education. I'm actually hoping that one day I don't need to preface that with positive, that actually it'll just be language education, and that that's what we do, and there won't be any need to use the word positive in front of it. But for the moment, I'll leave it there. So positive education is an approach to teaching language and life skills. It's a very deliberate way of teaching where you try to integrate your language learning goals and some life skill goals. Okay, and we'll talk a little bit more in a moment about what life skills are. The approach that we've taken, and at the moment it's more a theoretical approach, there's some practical stuff you'll see I get to at the end, but it's drawing on positive psychology. It draws obviously on SLA, so understanding what is good language learning, good language teaching, and also looking at general education. These are kind of three very influential fields for a lot of the work that I've done. And the idea is that it should be sustainable. That's probably a magic word I want to throw out there, is if you feel that this is an addition and, oh God, one more thing I've got to do, you're not going to do it. Teachers have got enough to do as it is, and if what I talk about today feels to you like an additional burden, you won't do it, and you shouldn't. So what I'm talking about today ought to be, I hope, a way that you can integrate this step by step and in ways that suit you. There's no one way of doing this, but that can be empowering for you and your learners, but it must feel manageable. Don't kill yourself over this, and don't feel that you've got some magic quota you should do that you're not doing. You do what you can and the best you can. And it's a dual-strand approach. And we've got a, we'll come to that in a moment, but a dual-strand approach means you have two learning aims in a lesson that you want to achieve. You have your linguistic goals, and then you have some other non-linguistic goals. And the idea is that these should be interwoven throughout your lesson, and that that's a way that you can teach. Um, what we have found in studies and research that has looked at this kind of approach so far, and there's been very, very little work on this so far, is that, of course, it is incredibly motivating for teachers to do this and for learners, because it meets exactly that problem of irrelevance. It helps learners and teachers to strengthen the relevance and the meaning of the classroom. So it very much deals a little bit with that why it adds additional purpose and meaning to what we do. Now, the problems I outlined at the beginning with the education system has been recognized. But rather than sort of fundamental deep changes to the education system, what has happened is we now have life skills in many curricula across the globe. I just picked a couple of flags to show that they are on pretty much every continent. And with my team, we've been looking at where these life skills are integrated in curricula. They are everywhere. So what it means is that policymakers and educators recognize that the system needs to be addressing these life skills, so they've put them in what we call the transversal curriculum. That is the curriculum that goes across all school subjects. But of course, nobody feels responsible for them. So they're there, so policy recognizes it, curricula recognizes it, but very little training is going in pre-service or in-service to teaching people how to teach these life skills. Nobody feels particularly responsible for them unless you have a particular passion, and they tend to be relatively neglected. Now, I've got a particular sense that ELT, we're in a relatively privileged position in this sense, that we can do this perhaps even more easily than maybe other subjects can do it. So we can teach ELT in the regular way that we teach it, but perhaps with a little bit of a life skill lens. This dual strand approach, you can see that I put this little guy holding a DNA, and that's supposed to just illustrate the notion of a dual strand approach. You have two strands, one is your linguistic goals, one is your non-linguistic goals, and they should be connected all the way through your lesson. I think that's a nice way, an idea I stole from the Positive Education Society. And we have this already. So CLT is very often about teaching other things. CLT is about teaching intercultural competence, about teaching uh, social awareness, about teaching empathy, about teaching digital literacy. My guess is that many of you do that already. So it's not vastly new what I'm suggesting. It's maybe a raising of consciousness about the diversity of life skills available and how we can do that. And of course, there is CLIL. Now, love it or hate it, CLIL does give us a great basis to understand the, the benefits and the challenges of teaching in a dual-strand approach. So we already have some models to work with. Um, many life skills, I think, are already being taught. But for PLT to survive as a notion, for us to really embrace this, and I'm at the beginning of doing this myself, it has to be sustainable. 
But I think more than anything, it becomes an attitude. It's a way of thinking about our teaching. It's not a set method. It's a bit like CLT in a sense that it's not a set do this and then you've done it and you've ticked your box. It's about thinking, how can I expand what I'm teaching, what's in my responsibility? How can I bring in other life skills, maybe to what I already have planned? It doesn't have to be massive changes, but it's a raising of consciousness and awareness of our remit as educators and what we can be doing. Just to give you a little example, I'm just going to, how am I doing? Well, not too bad. Okay, so there are lots of different frameworks for this that already exist. So UNESCO, look at this thing. That, I can't, can I point? I can't point. Um, one of the things that UNESCO, it was one of the first organizations to start talking about, look at the last two, learning to live and learning to be. So very explicitly expanding the remit of education beyond just the workplace and beyond schooling and saying well-being, life skills, social emotional regulation, these things need to be there as well. The dreaded PISA that many of you know. Do you know that they now measure learner well-being? I bet you didn't. Now, this is really interesting. I'm slightly depressed that it takes PISA to make people change attitudes, but OK, I'll live with it. Um, places like Singapore that score very high on literacy, very high on mathematics scores, but very low on learner well-being. And PISA recognized that this was in balance. This is not all that schools are about. And now they've introduced the measurement of learner well-being. And what they're saying is, you know what? It's not just about the school subject. There's other stuff that schools should be doing as well. And, when, and the irony is, is when learners have high well-being, they learn better. So you want high well-being for now, in the present, when they're learning in school, and you want it for the future as well. Many of you will be familiar with the Sustainable Development Goals and the aims of EDU 2030, which is that we should be addressing these issues, things like um, reducing poverty, um, health and well-being, uh, quality education, gender equality, and of course, climate action. Um, some other frameworks, the PEG21 framework that I saw this morning, um, and one that I've been working on with some colleagues together at OUP. Sorry, a little bit of self-promotion, I promise this is it. Um, one that I've been had the pleasure to work on at OUP. If you go to the QR code or the reference at the bottom, if you just type in Global Skills OUP paper, it's freely available. And it outlines our rationale for why we work with Global Skills, how we work with them, what we understand by Global Skills, and it gives very concrete ideas of how to do that in practice and also issues about assessment, which is a whole other sort of can of worms. So what do I mean by life skills? Um, I think I've stressed this as we go along. These are characteristics and capabilities that can be changed and developed. That's key to understand. These are not given. Um, these are things that can be developed, and they increase the chances of success and well-being in life. And that means beyond the workplace. It's how to flourish in life. Um, many of you will be familiar with the notion of the four C's. And one of the criticisms has been that this was really about how to prepare people for the workplace, to make them better workers. And the step back has been to say, hmm, there's more. Life means more than just the workplace. And there are other skills and other competences that our students need to develop to help them to cope in the way. It doesn't dismiss the need for the four C's, not at all. But it says there are some other things we should add to that. Can I just ask you to take a moment with a partner and say, what things would you include in a list of life skills if you were going to draw up the list? Go ahead.
Okay, thank you. Okay. Now, there's lots of different things you could have included. The great thing about this at the moment is that this isn't fixed. So pretty much anything that you feel is a life skill that your students would need, and that will, of course, vary across context and where you work, is perfectly valid response. So there isn't necessarily just a right and wrong. There's not a fixed list. But let, you, let me give you the list that I've been working with. So the four C's, obviously. So for those of you not familiar, the four C's, critical thinking, creativity, collaboration, communication, and digital literacy. Digital literacy being a broader notion of things like also um, fact-checking information, that kind of awareness thing. Intercultural competences, social-emotional competences, well-being literacy, global citizenship competences, and eco-literacy. So that's the ones that I have been working with. And perhaps the one I need to explain is global citizenship competencies. That can be relatively controversial when it's done in a top-down way. Global citizenship is a sense of we, are, we have an identity as members of the global community. And particularly through ELT, that's something that is being developed more and more, this notion that English is used actually as a way to connect people. Um, that the critiques of it as a lingua franca are perhaps not justified in a sense that it's actually empowering. It allows people to connect. And global citizenship is about feeling a sense of connectedness with others, a sense of shared community on the planet. And that leads to other things such as eco-literacy and eco-awareness. That global citizenship is feeling that this I'm part of a global community. I identify with that. I connect with people in different places and feel that we have a shared commonality. And I feel a sense of responsibility to act in regard to that global community. So there is most definitely, and I say this very consciously, a social justice and social activism agenda behind that notion of global citizenship, or certainly the way that I embrace the term. Um, one thing I will tell you, because it's interesting in relation to Norway, what has happened in Norway, and what will start from October onwards, is that they also had these things. They had global citizenship. This is also in the Austrian curriculum, for example, but nobody has even, most of my colleagues haven't even heard of the term, let alone know that it's in the curriculum they're meant to teach. Um, what happened in Norway was the same as I suspect happens in many places. These competences were in the transversal curriculum, but nobody felt responsible for them, and nobody was sort of systematically doing it. So certain individuals that felt passionate were doing it, but it certainly wasn't being done systematically. And I think that certainly I recognize that as a case in Austria, and I'm not sure about where you work, but I, I guess think that is the case in other places. So what Norway said is, OK, we need to change this. We need to make specific subject areas responsible for specific competences to make sure that they get covered. And what they've done is they've made global citizenship competences the responsibility of all foreign language teachers, understandably. So now in Norway, starting in October, the school curriculum explicitly expects teachers of foreign languages, so not just English, but all foreign languages, to deliberately and explicitly be teaching global citizenship at the same time. And you can imagine from what I explained earlier why that is a sensible decision in, in respect to Norway particularly, perhaps. But look at this conference. I went through the program, or the program that was online on Wednesday when I put this slide together. Um, and look at all the ways that we're already covering life skills. There were at least 21. I've been to one this morning, had to miss another one that I wanted to go to at the same time. But there's critical thinking skills, creativity, and cultural competence. Um, somebody's talking about citizenship. I will be there later. Um, Eco-literacy, social emotional competence is beyond the four C's, 21st century skills, well-being. So in this room, there are already people who are doing this. It is not dramatically, radically new. It's already happening. But what I'm trying to encourage you to do is think about that more consciously, more explicitly, and maybe expand the notion a little bit of what we understand by global skills or life skills. So let me give you a moment to just talk. Are you already working on life skills and which ones? I've put pictures here to illustrate things like self and strength. I went to a lovely talk yesterday, I think, where somebody said, I'm trying to boost the self-esteem of my learners. I want them to feel competent and good about themselves. That's a life skill. 
I've put things here about the environment. I know we've got some impassioned eco-literacy educators in the room. Are you already talking about that? Fake news, um, stopping bullying, working on empathy, creativity, digital literacy, strategic thinking, self-regulation, planning. Yes, I can. Competence, group dynamics, collaboration, cooperation. My guess is we're doing part of this already. It's not a radical addition to our teaching. It's just expanding our thinking about it a little bit. Just take a moment and find out what you and your partner are already doing in this respect. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, given the passionate talking in the room, I assume that we're all doing our little bit in the room. Um, I decided to look at some examples just to give you some illustration. And I've taken the model that's used in Quil CLIL, where you can talk about weak and strong forms. And I think some people can take very strong forms, a very strongly integrated approach to teaching life skills and language. And some people will do a softer version. You do what you can, and it's not the same every week. You move along that continuum. Some weeks it's a little less, sometimes it's a little more. You do what you can. There is nobody, least of all me, should be prescribing to you how you should teach. You find your own way. Um, if you can leave with anything today, but if you've been provoked to think about your teaching, then I'm happy. But I'm not here to tell you how to teach. You know that better than anybody. Um, but thinking about moving along this continuum is helpful. So thinking about different types of tasks, um, different ways that you can extend that. So perhaps even the sort of most straightforward and the simplest thing you can do is adding reflective questions to what you're already doing. Is there some way that you can promote them to think a little bit and prompt them to think in the direction of SDGs? There's a wonderful British Council publication about integrating global issues creatively into English language teaching. So there are people working on this already and the publishers are starting to recognize that. I had a wonderful conversation with John um, about some of the work that he and Lindsay have been doing about integrating global skills into textbooks, it's starting to happen much more explicitly. So sometimes, if you look at some of the earlier course books, um, one of my concerns was that life skills, global skills, however we refer to them, were a kind of add-on. They were just there, and if teachers had time, they'd do it, and if not, they just ignore it. And now the publishers themselves are starting to recognize they need to be much more interwoven, much more deeply integrated. But asking questions, looking at materials is one thing that you can do. Um, an example of a short activity that we've used, um, getting students to take photographs on their way to school or to university, and then they talk about the photographs, and we talk about what issues they raise, what did they notice, um, and this can be, then you can, if 
it's appropriate, you can then follow up into service learning, passive actions, you can look at projects that you can do with that. And there are all different skills that that looks at. Remember that citizenship is also not just about global issues, but somebody this morning said global. You start local, but the implication and the ripples are of course global. So you start with things in your community, issues locally that they can address, that they can become aware of and sensitized to. There are longer activities. Um, this is one that I would encourage you all to do. This is my favorite. Um, keeping a gratitude diary or keeping a gratitude jar. You know those big pasta jars you get, the, the clear glass ones? What you can get them to do is they can write down something they're grateful for and you pop it in the jar. You can do it in your family and you pop it in the jar and then at the end of the year you take them all out and you have a nice memory of all the things that you're grateful for during the year. Now, the thing with gratitude training is, is Taking time at the end of every day to think of what you're grateful for helps you to start seeing the positives in life more. So one day of saying, I'm grateful for this, is not going to make you happy and cheerful. But what happens is, is every day when you start to become more consciously aware of the things that you are grateful for, it helps you to start focusing on the positive and keep an emotional sense of balance. This is important for us as educators as much as it is for learners. And if I could give you one single tip for your well-being, it would be to engage in some kind of gratitude practices. It's the one intervention where research is unequivocal that it makes a difference to your emotional feel. And just right now, the media is a little depressing. And so it's, I think, more than ever, go home, you can go away from this conference. There's so much to be grateful for about this event and the people I've met and the talks I've been to and the fabulous organizers. Go home and appreciate it very consciously. And it will help your emotional balance over time. So that's a lovely thing to do with your students. Helps their well-being and helps yours as well. And of course, working with some kind of local community project or addressing some kind of concern, I have deliberately chosen to talk about how to make the school greener, so setting a project up to get students involved. We all know that project-based learning, inquiry-based learning is the most engaging type of learning, and so doing these kinds of projects with learners when they've got a little bit more proficiency as well is great. Um, I've taken the inspiration and the logo, I apologize, Sari, if you're here for stealing your logo, from ELT Footprint. If you don't know ELT Footprint, please go online, Google them, or go on Facebook and find them. They're a fantastic group of educators, passionate about um, eco literacy and environmental issues in ELT and how we can integrate it. They have lots of great resources and fabulous ideas that you can do. And they're a wonderful example of how it's already happening. So I'm not trying to suggest you have to do all these life skills. People will have their own passions that they will develop more. That's normal. But it's about broadening our thinking about what our responsibilities are and how we can include that. So I started off with three problems that I said that we as individuals in this room can address, and I think that we can. The fact that education systems are no longer fit for purpose has been recognized by policymakers. That's why life skills are in most curricula now. And it's up to us to bring that into our teaching, to make sure that we are actually covering that. They are a core focus of contemporary education. Making them part of our practice is our job to make that translation, to make it actually happen so that we can address the relevance of education, to make sure that teaching and education, whatever level, whatever context, is as fit for purpose as possible. I think that consciously integrating life skills into ELT gives us an even heightened relevance. I still think that ELT on its own is highly relevant. It's part of global citizenship. If you want to be in a global community, you need ELT. But conscious of some of the developments in some places, it may not affect you yet, but conscious that in the eyes of our learners, we want, to en we want engaged, active, passionate learners. If we can make them see the relevance of what we're doing in classes, not just about the language, but life beyond, that can boost their engagement and also boost our relevance for learners in their eyes. And we get a lot of meaning and pleasure out of what we do, and we are already doing one of the most meaningful jobs that exists. And we can perhaps strengthen that even further by reflecting on our why. 
going back to why we want to educate, what life skills do we want to transmit, how do we want to support our learners, how do we want to boost them and prepare them for life in the 21st century. So taking the model of positive language education and looking at what Simonick said was starting with the why, I would like to make the world a better place. And if you accuse me of being idealistic, I don't care. I think that the last thing you should lose as an educator is your idealism. As an educator, please stay idealistic right to the very end, because that's what the kids need, that's what society needs, and that's what you need to stay passionate and enjoying and flourishing in your job. I think PLE, an integrated approach to teaching English and life skills, is what we can do and how we can do it. I've just come back from a trip to Africa, I'm pleased to say, and there was a fantastic quote I saw while I was there, and I want to leave you with this quote. If you think you're too small to make a difference, you haven't spent the night with a mosquito. <laughs> I think you can make a great difference. You're educated, you're ELTers. Um, thank you very much for your time.